Hi, my name is Henry Egloff, and in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to develop a basic web page using HTML and CSS. So, this tutorial is the second part of a series that I've put together that is really just, just about setting you up with some fundamentals in terms of web design and coding. So before I forget, I have a step-by-step -step for this included on my web page. Um, so like I said before, this is a follow-on from my first um, tutorial, which was about how to code a basic web page using HTML. And so this one is about developing the web page a bit further. So what we where we left off in the last tutorial was we should have something like oops like this just a really really basic web page that's got a, a heading and a paragraph and a, a list so like i mentioned in the last tutorial what i'm doing in these tutorials is i'm also going through and explaining everything so i'm really um I've got some very simple step-by-steps, but I've got a lot of really detailed explanations for everything that I'm doing. So what we're going to aim for is we're just going to take this a little bit further today and we're going to end up with something like this. So we're just going to add an image and links in there, uh, a link in there and some very basic sort of layout styling. So. I've got uh, a lot to explain here and I'm just going to refer to this article and I'm just going to go through it bit by bit. So the first thing is I've got a section in here with the reference links. So I've got um, some links to um, some of the different sites that I'm going to be referring to. And I'll also include uh, links to this article and all these links in the YouTube description. So the next thing I was going to talk about was placeholder content. So if you were to follow these links, I've got things like this website here, Lipsum Pro, and this one here, HTML Ipsum. And I guess when you're sort of working with your code, sometimes it's really good to have some placeholder content like things like text for paragraphs and things like that so this website here lipsum.pro is really good because you can just sort of if you want something like a, a bunch of sentences or words or characters you can just i usually actually just click on paragraph and then it gives me a paragraph of random text in latin which can be really good for place holding so if I wanted to put this in my HTML document in this case this is just the text so I could just select it and then I could go to my document and this is the code that I had from uh, the last tutorial but I'm just going to select that code and delete it and I could do a opening paragraph tag a closing paragraph tag and then just paste that paragraph in there and so if I just save this and preview it in the browser you can see I've, I've, I'm able to use that placeholder paragraph. This website here, um, HTML Ipsum, is kind of good because it's got a lot of the sort of main elements you might want to use, like it's got things like um, an unordered list for example. So again, this time it's got the actual tags in it which can make it a little bit easier to use, but I could just select that, copy that, so I'm just doing Command C, Again, go back to my code and just paste that in there. And I'm just going to select that bit there and press tab on the keyboard to just format it a little bit, like I talked about in the last tutorial, and save it. And then I'll go back to the web and look at it. And there it is. So I just wanted to broach the topic of placeholder content because it can be really easy uh, it can make things a lot easier just to, to get content in your web pages when you're starting off with. This one here has also got this interesting one called Kitchen Sink, which has got a whole lot of elements in one. Like it, it especially when you're starting out, it, it kind of opens you up to a lot of stuff, a lot of elements you might not really need to begin with. Um, but that said, you can also sort of uh, learn a bit more about some of the different elements uh, that you could be working with. 
um, like kind of like reverse engineering them, for example, like, like this one here is um, an example of a navigation list, which is pretty good. So I can just again copy that and then I'll go to my code and paste that in there just underneath and I'll just save it and then go to the web and have a look at it. So that just creates a, 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 a list of menu items uh, in a navigation element. Um, anyway, moving on. So um, next thing I was going to talk about was adding images. So in terms of the code, that's fairly straightforward. And I've got a link, you know, as with everything that I am discussing and demonstrating like w3 schools has heaps of it has all the information you need really so um it's worth always going and just looking at the page on w3 schools because it it will explain in more detail um the things that i'm kind of brushing over here but look this is an example of the code that you would use to put an image in but um what i'm going to do first is actually get an image to use in my web page and sort of finishing off, sort of sorry, following on from last week, we created this this one here, and I, I suggested naming it my web page one. What can be useful is to just grab that whole lot and copy it, and just so all I did there, I'm on a Mac, was just hold down the Option key and then just rename it to my web page two. It, it that can be a good way to sort of like um, just keep some basic kind of stages of development as you're going along. So what I might do is I might open up that folder in my code editor, editor now. So here I am and I'll just close this one. So now to get the image. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I, I think sometimes it's useful demonstrating this even though it's sort of something a little bit sort of outside actual web design but what I'm going to do is just make a new tab and I'm going to search for frog in, oops frog in Google and then I'm going to click on the the menu for images and this will bring up all the images of frogs in Google so sometimes what I like to show my students is how to access images that are, are better to use um, in terms of copyright and so what you can do is you can click on the tools tab and click on usage rights and click on label for reuse of course it, you don't really have to worry about this if you're not publishing your images but um, it, it can it's just something to be aware of so if I hover over the images the numbers here are basically showing me how many pixels are in the image so the higher the number the more resolution is in the image um, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky though because sometimes what people do is they have an image that has low resolution and they upsize it in which case this can be a little bit misleading but most of the time it's fine but I'm just going to click on this image here and I can see that it's in the Wikipedia website and you know I need to click on it first to really open up the full image and what I can do is I can just right click on that image and go save image as and I'm going to put it into the folder that I created before uh, where am I um, put it in my desktop Oops, sorry, my web page two images and I'll just do save and I'm just gonna open up my web page two going to images and, and, and that's the file name there and sometimes when you're starting off it just makes it easier to have a, a simpler file name um, but I'm going to so I'm just gonna call it frog and so there's where my HTML document is there's a folder called images and then there's the file in there called frog so now if I go back to my article where I've got the image code here what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste that code and put it in my web page something like that and I'll just do save and 
check that it's all working in the browser. So that's pretty good. One thing that I'm going to talk about a bit later on is how to get this image to scale inside the window. Because this image uh, had relatively high resolution, like it's, it's actually um, overflowing outside my sort of image er uh, window area, um, but I'll get into that a bit later. So back to my code. So basically like what the, the image tag is um, the first tag that I'm demonstrating that is a self-closing tag. So whereas all the other, other tags needed an opening and a closing tag, an image tag uh, is self-closing. Um, and the, what, what is here in the source is actually the, um, it's the pathway to the images. So, and it is, this is um, what you'd call like a relative uh, link or a relative path. It's, it's going from where this document is and then it's looking in the images folder and it's looking for a file called frog.jpg. And it's really important that you include the um, file extension because if you, do, if you don't, it won't work. Now the alt tag is basically a description of the image and you, for accessibility reasons, you really need to put this in, uh, include an alt tag. Um, and this is for like visually impaired users and it, it basically describes what the image is about. Um, so uh, that, that, that's the sort of the main essential ingredients um, for an image, putting an image in a document. And so I'll just keep moving along. So the next thing I was going to talk about was including links. And so to write a link tag, it's written with um, an A and then you um, do href and what I often do is I, I do the opening and closing uh, speech marks first and then close it off and then do the closing A tag so this is a link. So this is a link and so sometimes when you're starting off you just want to, you can just put a hash symbol in there and that's really useful uh, because it kind of creates like a, a placeholder link. So there it is down there. Um, it's a link that doesn't go anywhere, basically. So if I wanted to do like a, a link to a page on the web, what I might do is um, I might link to the Wikipedia page that this uh, image is actually on. So I'm going to click on the page and I'm going to copy the link that's up here. So I'm just doing, you know, copy. And then I'm going, going, going to go to my code and paste that in there and save it. Now I go back to my web page and refresh it. And so now if I click on the link, it goes to that page. So getting back to my code. So there's two different types of paths that's happening here. Like this one is a relative path to the images folder and then the image file in it. And this is what you call like an absolute link. It's a link to something that's on the net. And they will usually start with an HTTP or HTTPS address or www. etc. So that's the basics of putting a, a link in. And in this case, you can see that like my A tags wrap around that text, but I can also wrap my link around my image. So if you click on my image, it will go to that link. And so it's just the difference here, it's just text and here it is the image and again, save it. I'll go back to my web page, refresh it and click it and it's a link to a web page. So that's the basis of links. And I also talked about um, relative versus absolute file paths. And now what we want to do is we want to get into the topic of responsive web design. So I've got a link up here to this article here, Adam Kaplan grid. 
I think this is a really great article um, because it, it sort of describes the uh, principles of responsive web design really well and it's got a lot of really good uh, little code snippets. I, I normally talk about media queries a little bit later on so I'm not going to get into that just yet. But um, I strongly encourage you to read through this article. But the, the basic principle of responsive web design is about creating websites that will scale basically to different screen sizes. So everything will fit in and um, work really well on like a, a, sp a smaller, thinner mobile screen to a larger, wider desktop screen, for example. And as he mentions in his article here, a bit further down, the viewport meta tag. So this is, I, I kind of just see that this is kind of like a must have in any kind of web page code. Um, I don't know if you've ever by chance visited a web page and um, it's like everything's appeared really small because the web page hasn't scaled properly um, on, on like a smaller screen, like a mobile. But so, if you include this code within the head of your document, it um, it basically tells the browser to scale your web page. I mean, there's more that you have to do, but you, you really need that fundamental ingredient in there. And I might just zoom out my code a little bit so you can see it in one line, maybe even one more. And in Sublime Text, you just do that by doing Command minus. So that's the basics of responsive web design and putting in the viewport meta tag. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to start applying some CSS. So there are two main ways you can apply the CSS. One is like what you'd call inline CSS. And if I was just making a one page web page example, that's what I would do just so that um, my HTML and my CSS are all in one document. And the way I, I would do that is I would create an opening and closing style tag and then I could include um, CSS styling here. And maybe I'll just do a quick example. Um, what I'm going to do is write body. And CSS works by first, firstly, you pick the element that you want to apply the style to. And in this case, I'm going to pick body. And I'm going to, and then you do an open and closing squirrely bracket. And then you can um, start adding properties and values. So the property that I'm going to target here is what's called background color background color and I'm just going to write light blue and so the property and the value is separated by a colon and you you basically finish that line with a semicolon and then you can write other properties oops other properties underneath um, because you'll often be applying more than um, one property to um, an element. Now also bear in mind what I mentioned in the last tutorial about the structure of HTML, how all the elements within a tag kind of belong to that element. So when I am applying style to the body element, I'm, all the elements inside the body by default will inherit that style. But anyway, I'll just do save, I'll go to the web and refresh. It's a bit hard to see because my image is so big, but I've got a blue background. So this is inline CSS where like my section of CSS code is embedded within my HTML document. And there are many cases where you might want to do that. And it actually doesn't matter where you put it. It used to be that you had to put it between the head tags, but you can also put it um, yeah anywhere in your document and you can also actually apply CSS straight onto an element but I'm not going to demonstrate that now. Um, certainly have a look at all the information on W3 schools as it will explain things in much more detail. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an external style sheet. What I might do is I might just do copy that first and delete that. So Typically, like if you're creating um, a website that has multiple web pages, you want them all to refer to the same 
um, CSS style sheet. And that makes sense because then you can adjust your styles in one pay in one place, and all your pages will um, be drawing on those same styles. So um, back to my article. I've got a link for this in here somewhere. Um, how to add CSS. So there's a this is the this line of code here will basically link your document to an external CSS document. And so I'm just going to paste that in the head. That this sort of this bit of code will always go in the head. And you've got to get the file path right. So I'm going to I'm going to put this my CSS file in a folder called CSS. And that's kind of like a good practice because you might want to have multiple CSS documents and it's just good for organization to keep them all in one folder. So what I'm going to do is do CSS slash style. So it's going to look in the folder called CSS and look for the document called style. And I'm going to make that document. So I'm just going to do command N for new and I'll pay, oops, and I'll just do um, save as make sure I save it in the right folder and I'll just call it style.css and I accidentally copied over that code that I copied before so I'll just do body background color um, light blue save and just while I'm here I'm going to um, write a bit of code which I, I would normally include in in most websites that I do, which is I'm, I'm going to apply to the image tag and I'm just going to write max width 100% uh, and I'll save this. Let's have a look at my web page now. So now you can see that what happens is when I scale my document, my image is always fitting in there. It's still very, very big, but it's not overflowing out. So that bit of code that I wrote before it, it just means that your image tag, and remember that it is defined uh, image as in IMG, it will never be bigger than the element that it's in. So that's, that's like I said, it's kind of like a handy bit of code that I would add to just about every web page that I do. Now, um, another thing that people, a, a, a general good practice um, that, um, Adam Kaplan also describes in that grid article is creating a container div. So this is a little bit different to using the the the, the elements that are standard HTML elements. Like I'm going to create a div and I'm going to choose to call it container. And div is just short for sort of um, division. I believe I'm not 100% sure, um, but it basically like it's a way of putting elements within another element, wrapping um, elements in an element, and you can call it whatever you want. And I'm going to talk a little bit um, about what a class is in a second, um, but I'll create it first, I've called it container, and then because I've created it as a class, I'm going to write, um, when I want to style it, I have to start it with a full stop or a period. And I'm just going to do this standard little formula which works really well, with the, which is the width, 90%. So what this means is by default, it'll have a little bit of a cushion on each side. And then I'll do max width. In this case, I'll just do, say, 800 pixels. And I'm going to do margin zero auto. I'm going to explain this in more detail in a second, but that basically will center this div in the middle of the window. And I'm also going to put a border on it, one pixel dotted um, gray. Let's see if this works. Oops. And save it and then go to my window and refresh it. And that didn't work. I've done wrong. Make sure that I've saved my HTML document. There we go. So you can see that what this does is it it ha it allows a bit of space on each side. It allows it to expand but stay in the middle. And so that's a very very standard kind of formula for a container. And it could be called anything, um, but 
uh, it's sort of like a practice that a lot of people would call that kind of um, div container. Uh, you know, most websites, what they'll do is they will sort of contain the content within a sort of centralized area within the window. So it will scale up to a certain point but um, won't go wider than that. And you can see the little dotted line that I put around it. So and he, getting back to how CSS works, so here you can see that I'm applying multiple properties to the uh, one element. And this is all set up as an external CSS document so that I could create multiple uh, pages that could refer to this um, same style sheet. So when you kind of create these divs, there are uh, two types that you can create. You can create like one called a class or one called an ID. The idea is that a class is something that is reused and an, and an element can contain uh, multiple different classes or I should say can belong to multiple different classes whereas an ID tag is something that you would really just use for um, one element and usually that's when you're using code like JavaScript and you really want to sort of um, talk to one specific element so I've got I've got some examples in my um, web page uh, in the article about this um, where I've I even threw together like a really basic example here and I'll, I'll, I'll just open that up actually in my code editor and in the browser so that you can see it so what I created here was two different classes I created one called angry and one called intense um, and so with the angry class I just created a, a property where the color will be red and in CSS when you sort of say color that's the color of text whereas if you want the color of a background you use background color and I created another class called intense and now I cre I've, I've put in two headings here they're both h1s like primary headings and in this one I've applied the class angry and the class intense and this one angry and so I've written some text within those tags sort of just to describe what's happening and I'll just open this in a browser so hopefully that might just give you um, an idea of how an element can have multiple different classes applied to it uh, one thing that's happening here that is interesting is notice how when I put the background color on um, the intense style, it spans the whole width of the window. Now that is because by default an H1 tag is what is referred to as a block element in that it, it spans the whole whole horizontal space. You, you know, often that is the way headings are in things like, you know, a book or a document, for example. So I'm not going to get into that right now, but it's definitely something worth noting because um, this type of thing is something that you really um, is really relevant when you start getting into CSS layout and you want to understand kind of when elements span a whole line and when elements um, sort of don't and they flow next to each other. Um, I'll talk about that in more detail later. So um just getting back to my document yeah so i've got that example in there and i've also got a a, a, a a little example of how you would write it as an id tag so you know uh sometimes i tell my students if you want to think about it you could think about even like the people in the class like they they, they might belong to say a class of being a male or a female or a blue-eyed or a brown-eyed person but they ultimately have one unique ID so I which you know so um, you know and general the, the general idea is that if you use an ID tag it's just you would only have that element in your document once so another thing that comes up here is 
the way I wrote this bit of code here, margin auto. And I thought I would quickly explain that because it comes into the topic of CSS shorthand. So when you have two values that are being applied to a property, um, the first value is the top and bottom and the second value is the left and right. Um, but alternatively, you can sort of like, and I also haven't explained what margin is. Margin is the space around an element. So the space between that element and the element before it or after it. So here I can, I can target, you know, the margin that's just on the top side of the element and I can set it to zero. Zero means no value um, and bottom. So, so what I've written here is exactly the same as what I've written here. I've just, this is sort of the, the longer way to write it. Um, and if I had the same uh, value that was going to be on the top, bottom, left and right, I could just, I could just simply apply it to margin. Um, and so that would be a 20 pixel margin on all sides of the element. And I could also, if I wanted to target each side in the one line, I could do margin 10 pixels, 20, 20 pixels and so on. And this is the top, right, bottom, left of the object. So often I tell my students to think about like a clock and just go clockwise. And what I've written here is exactly the same as what I've written here, just written in a shorter way. So I just thought I'd touch on that because you'll probably see that coming, you know, coming up. And I also did CSS shorthand here for the border element. So, you know, this could be written like border width one pixel and so on, but I've just done it all in one. And this element that I've written here is um, a, color, a color. And that's something I, I wanted to sort of bring up in this uh, tutorial as well, um, which I might as well do now. So I've got, I've got links to this um, in the article. Where are we? Working with color. So, you know, color in itself is a fairly complex kind of topic and I don't really want to go into it in too much detail right now. There are a bunch of different ways color can be um, written in code. Like I did an example before where I wrote it as light blue. So certain colors can be written um, just in text, um, but you know they're they're sort of predefined so that they uh, can be written in text. Most commonly, they're they're written in what's called like a hexadecimal color value. Uh, just in a nutshell, like colors are made up of sort of. Uh, three wavelengths of color are red, green, and blue, blue or RGB. So hexadecimal colors sort of have a, a value for, for the red, green, and blue um, with two characters there. So like I said, I, I just sort of want to brush over this for now. Um, I've, I've got a link to this color picker and you can do things like you can pick a color and then you can also, the, I would just say start with the hexadecimal value and sort of what you can do is you can copy and just copy that value. Um, I'll go to my style sheet and I'll, I'll just put that in instead of that one. Now it ha the hexadecimals have to start with a hash sign and I'll save that and I'll go to my website and have a, oops, not that one, have a look at it. So there you could see the background color change. And of course you can apply color to text and all that sort of stuff, but I'm, I'm just not going to do that right now. So one last thing I wanted to mention in this tutorial is commenting code because that's really, really important. Um, so in Sublime Text, you can actually just select a, select some code and then do command backslash and it automatically writes the comments for the, the comment for you. And basically a, a, a comment starts and finishes with certain characters of code and notice here how it's grayed out what's between them and basically it, it kind of like disables that code like the browser won't um, apply or render that code so 
often pe what people are doing is they are putting comments in code to describe what code is doing to um, other developers if it's not obvious and also what they might be doing is just there might be well I do this a lot I might have sections of code that I'm not sure about that I'm developing that I might want to use later and I will comment them out so um, sometimes what I do uh, with my students when they're starting out is I encourage them to go through and actually put comments next to all their code so that they can um, have their own little reference for what the code is doing um, and CSS has comments as well so um, the way they're written in CSS is they start off with a slash and then a star and they end with a star and then a slash and so the code is there but it's just not going to be used and again this can be really good for um, commenting what your code is doing something like that so there I can keep that border around that element um, but just comment it out so you know if I ever ever need it there I can um, take those comments away and see it and I, I did that example of putting a border around it because sometimes I sort of describe to my students that when I've wrapped um, elements within a div sometimes a good way to think about it is almost like it's like a fence around those elements see like you know my link and my image is within there I might even just quickly put a paragraph of text in there as well just so that you can see that and save and go to my web page Oops. which one am I this one there we go and I mean the good thing about using that um, little formula I did for the container is it sort of it it it, it sets things off for the um, responsive web design because everything fits in there um, when you start getting into responsive web design you're going to want to do things like make that text scale up and maybe even change the layout of things um, as you get into larger or smaller screens and I can see a little mistake there up here link to style so I'll just take that out save here we go so hopefully that um, gives you a grounding in um, a lot of those elements um, that those topics that I've talked about and I mean if you can end up with something like this then um, and you can understand sort of some of those principles behind it then you're tracking really well so I will leave it there um, that's all